on our, our stage. We have a we will follow up on um, what to expect when our world gets hotter and hotter. And I want you all to welcome uh, Hanno. A big applause, please. Yeah, Hanno will talk about climate breakdown. The reality is bleak. And without further ado, please enjoy the talk and I hand over to Hanno. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, um, I, I, th I wanted to start with a bit of motivation because like you may have seen me before talking on CCC events and it's usually either about IT security or about uh, general issues with science. Um, so you may wonder why I see now talking about climate change. And I actually was kind of a climate activist for a long time and I also wrote for some time for a, a climate, uh, for a news publication which was specifically on climate change. But I kind of um, dropped out of the topic which was also due to frustration, due to other things kind of worked better for me. But then there came 2018 um, and several things happened, like, I mean, you all know we had an extremely dry summer. Um, then I noticed uh, suddenly um, the Hambach forest uh, was in the news every day, which is like a, uh, there's a protest camp from people who want to stop the coal mine. And like it's been there for, f I, I think, five years already at that point. But then suddenly it was uh, mainstream news, like nobody had, like basically uh, there was not much attention for it before and now, it, yeah. And then of course uh, Greta Thunberg started uh, her school strike and there was the Fridays for Future movement and there were new groups like Extinction Rebellion. Um, I actually went to a talk from Extinction Rebellion in spring which was uh, very extreme and uh, very emotional and uh, very impressive and so and yeah like a mixture of these things made me think yeah what's my role in this like it it brought the topic back on the table and yeah one thing i did is i submitted this talk here um yeah so um where are we so um, this is a graph of uh, well CO2 emissions. Um, as you can see, it's usually growing. Um, it goes till 2017. It grew even more in 2018. Um, you can also see like there's this point in time, like for a short time, the world really started to get serious to do something about it. Uh, well, or no, I mean that was the economic crisis. So. It wasn't really intentional, to, but that was kind of... The economic crisis was the only point there where you can really see that there was a bit of a drop in emissions, but otherwise emissions just go up. Um, we have now roughly one degree warming, and increasingly we can see the effects. Um, we had a big heat wave in India in May and June, what you see on the left is like this is a water reservoir, how it's usually, and on the right it's all dried out. I think it's not so good to see, but like on the screen it looks very extreme. <laughs> um, of course, we had another heat wave in Europe. Um, we had in, in Germany, we had the t highest temperatures ever measured, and it uh, was beyond 42 degrees, and like. Historically, usually the temperatures in Germany never were uh, beyond uh, 40 degrees. Um, we have wildfires in the Arctic, which, um, like, uh, which were, are at a scale that has not been seen before uh, since this is uh, m measured or observed. Uh, we have melting in Greenland, which is uh, much faster than what the science predicted in the past. Yeah. So, um, what is politics doing about this? Um, in 2015, there was the, the Paris Agreement, and like many people cheered, the environmentalists were happy, now the world is finally doing something about it, and 
So this was kind of a worldwide agreement, which was the result of a very long process of climate conferences. Um, what does the Paris Agreement say? Basically says all nations agree to at least three degrees of more uh, global heating. That may not be what you heard about it, um, but um, I would say that it, this is more accurate than what you probably heard about it. Um, so where's that discrepancy? Um, so what this agreement actually says is nations agreed to uh, limit uh, the global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. And also it says uh, that the nations agreed to pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. Um, but there's a problem with this, and this is they just declare that they want to do this, but they don't have a plan how to do it. Um, so this Paris Agreement, they have something which is called uh, nationally determined contributions. The idea is basically the nations that come together, they say, okay, we volunteer to reduce our emissions by that amount. We do this to counter climate change. And if you add that up, there have been multiple studies, you end up with something like three degrees. There are also some studies that said more 3.4 degrees. So we have like a big gap here where the nations say, okay, we want to limit it by at least two degrees or even less. But in reality, what they agreed upon will lead us to three degrees or more. Um, that is if they commit to these, uh, these voluntary agreements. Um, which unfortunately they usually don't. Like, I mean, if you're from Germany, you probably know Germany has uh, climate goals, which by now it's already clear for 2020, these goals will be breached by large amounts. And I mean, that was part of these uh, agreed contributions to do something about this. Um, so I, I thought I'd make this a bit in a table because these degree numbers, they often come up and to get a bit of an idea, like uh, that's uh, always when we talk about this, these degrees of warming, it's always like compared to what was before we had industrialization. So right now we're around one degree. Um, in the talk before, you heard 1.1. That's uh, minor details. It's around one degree. Um, the ambitious goal of the Paris Agreement is 1.5 degree. The kind of minimum goal is two degree. What they actually agreed upon is probably three degrees, and if you take the current policy, it's three to four or maybe even more. Um, of course, there are things in politics that are kind of even worse. We know we have a US president who doesn't believe in global warming. He often has uh, very insightful contributions on Twitter, like here, record low temperatures and massive amounts of snow. Where the hell is global warming? Um, also, this is a quote from the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. They had a, a meeting with people from, from small island states that are very much threatened by sea level rise. So many of these island states uh, will disappear in the future. And he said, yeah, I also get a little bit annoyed when we have people in those sort of countries pointing the finger at Australia and say we should be shutting down all our resource sector so that, you know, they will continue to survive. Like, how dare they want to survive? Um, but there's also positive things, like um, Canada agreed to declare a climate emergency on the 17th of June. Well, um, sounds good, right? Uh, what does that mean? Um, so on the 18th of June, one day later, uh, Canada approved the Trans Mountain Oil Pipeline. Um, the picture you're seeing here is oil mining. I'm um, not sure if you knew that this is uh, actually a thing, but there's something which is called tar sands, which is kind of oil in non-liquid form, and with a very energy-intensive process, you can turn it into liquid oil, um, which Canada is doing a lot, and they kind of have a problem that they cannot uh, transport enough away to make it economically viable, so that's why they want to build this pipeline. Um, this pipeline has kind of a long story. Uh, there was originally a company who wanted to build it, um, but then the company stepped down and now the government wants to build it itself. 
So um, that's how climate emergency looks in Canada. I, um, I mean, there are also currently a lot of initiatives, for example, in Berlin, where people want cities to declare a climate emergency. Um, I hope that's not there, uh, how they want to go about this. Um, these are, of course, some extremes, but keep in mind that like even countries that commit to more ambitious goals, for example, Germany, uh, usually uh, you can sum it up that almost nothing meaningful happens. Like, uh, certainly nothing happens that would be in line with uh, limiting climate change to a level that is somehow acceptable. Um, so what does the science tell us? Um, so uh, in climate science there's the IPCC, which is a, a worldwide network of scientists and they are kind of the mainstream of climate science. They summarize um, other results from climate science and uh, they write reports. Uh, every few years there's a general report, the last was 2014, and then there are occasionally special reports on specific topics. Um, and one of these more recent reports was the special report on 1.5 degree. That was after the Paris Agreement and the question they asked in this report is basically what's the difference between 1.5 degree warming and 2 degree warming. And yeah. Um, and the report had two major messages. Uh, one was there is a substantial difference, so it's not just uh, a number that's nicer, there are really uh, massive differences uh, in the outcomes. And also, the other message was like 1.5 degree, that is still doable under somewhat optimistic assumptions if the world immediately starts to transform to a low carbon economy, um, which is not working out so well. Um, so, what did they say? Um, for example, um, here's a very nice picture of a coral reef. Um, some of them look like this, and um, in the future probably all of them will look like this. So the estimate was that if we have 1.5 degree warming, then 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs will die. And if we have 2 degree warming, then 99 percent, so basically all of them will die. Um, then uh, there were estimates on whether we will have an ice-free Arctic in the summer, and the uh, estimate was that with 1.5 degree, this will happen in 10 percent of all years, and with 2 degrees, this will happen every summer. Um, we will have a bit more sea level rise. Um, there will also be uh, many more people affected by extreme heat waves. And these are the things like where you can, I mean, when there's sea level rise, then people have to relocate, so you will have refugees. When there are heat waves, at some point, people just cannot live somewhere anymore. So these are the things that have a lot of potential for conflicts, for migration movements. Um, these are the things that will make it really hard to keep up a working civilization. Um, and remember that right now we're on track to 2 to 4 degrees, uh, which is much more plausible than having 2 degree or 1.5 degree. Um, and they also ha had a rough estimate what would be needed for 1.5 degree. Uh, that would mean that the world would have to reduce the emissions by about 50% till 2030. Um, in the report it says 45%, but based on 2010, I'm not entirely sure why they made this very specific year, but that would be roughly 50% from now. Um, and the world needs to be carbon neutral by 2050, which means no more carbon emissions, or if there are carbon emissions, we would have to compensate with other things. Um, but there's also a question, is, like, is the IPCC really telling us the full story here? And uh, the following I'm going to say, I, I really don't want to get this as a criticism of the IPCC, because like, these are scientists that work under enormous pressure, like, if you know, like, you're, it's a committee that, uh, uh, like, politics has tell, told them, yeah, we want to know the science, and then the politicians tell them, yeah, but 
we don't believe in that, right? I mean, stupid scientists. So I think they work under very diffi difficult conditions, and it's very understandable why these things happen. That, but um, a lot of scientists are worried that the IPCC is really much too conservative in, in its predictions. And so, for example, you can see graphs like this, where this, uh, the black line here is the estimate from the IPCC report uh, from 2007 on Arctic sea level ice. And the blue range is what they assume that's probably the, the margin of error. So we believe it will be inside this blue area. And the red line is what actually happened. And this was already outdated at the point where they published it, which is kind of another problem. Like these IPCC reports are often based on science that's already maybe five years old when it gets into the IPCC report. And to enhance this a bit, I have added two more dots. Like 2012 was until now the lowest point of uh, Arctic sea level ice and 2018, which is the la last measure we have because 2019 hasn't, uh, isn't finished yet. Um, and um, in 2013, there was a study where they, they looked at, at various of these issues and previous studies that had compared, uh, ha that had looked at historic predictions from the IPCC, and they came to the conclusion that available evidence suggests that scientists have in fact been conservative in their projections of the impacts of climate change. Uh, we suggest, therefore, that scientists are biased not towards alarm alarmism, but the, or rather the reverse, towards cautious estimates, where we define caution as erring on the side of less rather than more alarming predictions. So what they're saying here is, yeah, so there's definitely a tendency that the scientists tend to make it sound less dramatic than it really is. Um, if you want to know more about this in detail, there's um, this little booklet and you can download it for free online, which explains many of these issues where, um, where the IPCC has underpredicted things and why this happened. And, and like they also quote a lot of scientists who are working within the IPCC, but who are kind of uh, frustrated that uh, they see that their results are not fully represented there. Um, that's worth a read. Um, um, there's also this thing that like climate scientists are telling us um, that we need to act fast and then we kind of can still make it. Um, but they've been saying similar things for a long time. Like you could hear very similar messages 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that we need to act really fast and then we can still keep it below two degrees or... Um, so what's going on here? Um, the science didn't get more optimistic, so quite the contrary. Um, so how is that possible? And um, one explanation here is uh, so-called negative emissions. Um, so by now, all the scenarios from the IPCC that limit warming to two degrees, uh, to 1.5 degrees, and most that limit it to two degrees, assume that we will have negative emissions in the future where we get the carbon dioxide out of the air and do something with it. Um, how can we get negative emissions? One way is to plant trees, which is good. Um, we should do that. Um, but like, there was a study in the news two or three weeks ago where they had very optimistic predictions on what we could reach with trees, and it was kind of painted as, yeah, this is the easy way out. We can continue like we do. We can fly and drive our cars and plant a few trees and everything's fine. Um, the study, they had a major flaw in, not in the study itself, but in the way they presented it in a press release, where they kind of uh, estimated twice as much potential as there really was in the study. Um, and yeah, so, but in general, like planting trees is good, but it has limits, like trees need space. We don't have unlimited space. And also, it kind of competes with other uses of land. Um, we, we need to grow food, and we will have more humans in the future, and we will have problems with food production due to climate change. So we may also need more land for food. So there, it's not an easy way out. Um, so when we talk about negative emissions, we have to talk about this thing called carbon capture and storage. Um, 
the idea here is we take CO2, either we take it directly from maybe a power plant or we get it out of the air and store it underground. Um, so there was a kind of bigger discussion about this in Germany during the last wave of new po coal power plant constructions. So what you often heard there was something like, yeah, okay, we know that it's bad with these coal power plants, they produce a lot of carbon dioxide, but it's not really a problem because later we're going to put the CCS technology on those plants and then it's not a problem anymore. Um, Vattenfall had a very um, big press conference where they announced they have the first carbon neutral power plant, carbon neutral coal power plant. Um, that never happened. Um, one reason was there was resistance. So in the areas where they wanted to store the carbon dioxide underground, there was a lot of controversy. Um, but also similar projects in other countries where there was no resistance also failed. And the simple reason is it's too costly. Like it costs a lot of money. You reduce the already low efficiency of your coal power plant even more if you want to add the CCS technology. Um, and right now there are only a handful of CCS projects operating worldwide. So, um, and most of them are actually for something which is called enhanced oil recovery, which means you uh, pump carbon dioxide in an oil field so you can get a bit more oil out of it. As you can guess, that's not a good idea for the climate because then you have more oil and you will probably burn it. Um, but then you can make it economically viable, so, um, yeah. Um, so, but what I think what the story from Germany tells you that if you talk about things like carbon capture and storage, there's always kind of this risk that people will use this as an excuse. They say, yeah, we can have carbon-free coal power plants, which didn't happen, but it was still used as an excuse. Um, but we were talking about negative emissions and not about coal power plants with fewer emissions. So, one idea here is that you could use bioenergy and CCS, like for example you burn trees and then you capture the carbon and store it underground because the trees, when they grow up, they store carbon and if you then store it, that would effectively be negative emissions. Um, yeah. Um, that obviously comes with all the problems that you usually have, have with bioenergy. It needs space if you have monocultures, maybe pesticides. There is uh, sometimes land, uh, sometimes forests are cut down to plant palm oil trees to use them for energy. So, um, and uh, the bioenergy itself can be a source of emissions. For example, if you cut down the rainforest for palm oil trees, then cutting down the rainforest will create emissions. So this is problematic, and also um, we will already have problems with food security and uh, bioenergy can increase that problem because we will have more competition for land. Um, so that is kind of why by now the scientists are also very skeptical and say we should maybe use as little as possible from this uh, bioenergy and CCS. Um, Another idea that is gaining a bit of traction is so-called direct air capture, which is just you build a machine that takes CO2 out of the air and stores it underground. Um, this is less problematic from a land use perspective because this, like, using trees or plants to suck in carbon dioxide, that needs a lot of space. This is the the space is not the problem here, but. Um, Obviously, these machines will require energy, which will be mostly electric energy because like, it doesn't make sense to power them with coal or something. <laughs> it needs to be clean energy, <laughs> otherwise it makes no sense. Um, and there was a study where they s looked at like, yeah, how does this play out with the IPCC scenarios and they, they calculated that this could use up to 300 exajoules per year if you look at the IPCC 1.5 degree scenarios. Uh, to compare that, um, the world electricity generation is currently 75 exajoules. So we would kind of have to increase the world electricity production uh, fourfold and then make it green and use that to capture carbon dioxide from the air. Um, which sounds 
like it sounds really like science fiction. So, yeah. So, one criticism of the IPCC is that their optimistic scenarios rely on technology that largely doesn't really exist, or only in small plants, but it doesn't exist at a reasonable scale. And it's very questionable if it's plausible to scale it up in a way that it can match these negative emissions that uh, they think we should have. And even if the technology works, like, how do you make that work in a political and economical way? You can think about it. Like, I mean, sucking out carbon dioxide out of the air, that doesn't make any money. Um, where's the business model here? And I mean, of course, yeah, I know the idea here is at some point we will have a worldwide carbon market and they will get paid. But you can also have questions here about how plausible that is. Um, but um, the, probably the biggest criticism of the IPCC is uh, around so-called feedback loops. Um, so, and also uh, so-called tipping points. So. Many scientists think that uh, the IPCC has not sufficiently considered uh, these effects. And um, a feedback loop is when global warming causes more global warming. And um, one example is the so-called albedo effect, where here you see an image of ice and water, and you can see the ice is bright and the water is dark. So bright things reflect sunlight and dark things don't. So if the ice is gone, then more sunlight will warm up the water and we will have more warming. Otherwise, some of the sunlight would be reflected back into space and would not warm up the Earth. Um, um, yeah, that's what I just said. And there are plenty of these feedback loops. In the talk before I heard, there are right 60 identified. Um, some of them are like the melting permafrost um, is releasing methane. Methane is also a greenhouse gas and a much more effect, much more potent greenhouse gas, at least on the short term. Um, then if peat box die, uh, that's a torf more in German, if you don't know the word. Um, if forests burn, like the, if they regrow, it's kind of fine if they regrow at the same speed, but if they burn down faster than they can regrow, we have also um, increased warming. And also, uh, if more water evaporates, that uh, water, uh, evaporated water itself is also acting as a greenhouse gas. And there are many more of these. Um, and the kind of horror scenario is if you think that it could, you could run into a situation where there are all these effects, where the warming is in creating more warming, and that is creating even more warming, and then you may have a situation where all these effects accelerate each other, and you have something which is called a runaway climate change, where you end up in a situation where it doesn't really matter what humanity does at this point, it just keeps getting warmer. Um, and there was a study, I think, last year, where a group of scientists uh, kind of tried to give an overview of this issue and uh, summarize the most important. This graph is from the study. So, and you can also see that there are the yellow ones are the ones where they are already at risk of um, of reaching that tipping point, or they already have. For example, for the West Antarctic ice sheet, currently the assumption seems to be that there's no way to save that. It will just melt and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and that could lead to a situation where it, these other effects that <coughs> only start at a higher temperature also get started and we run to a situation where it cannot be controlled anymore. Um, and the scary message from that study is that they say they cannot really say when this will happen because there are so many uncertainties, but it could already happen if in a two-degree warming scenario. Um, yeah. Um, after we talked about the science, let's talk about the media. Um, because I, I think it's quite obvious that large parts of the population are not really aware of the scale and the risks of the climate crisis. Like, I mean, they know that there's something happening with climate change and probably that it has to do with CO2 emissions, 
but I don't read about runaway climate change in the news. I'm not sure about you. Um, and uh, a problem that has been identified is a so-called false balance. And what does that mean? I have a nice uh, comic here. So here's a guy from television, and he uh, is interviewing an astrophysicist about the solar system, and then he wants to balance that opinion with someone from the Flat Earth Society. Now, that's of course ridiculous, but that's also what you often have when it's about climate change. So you will often have a situation where media uh, asks the climate scientists, and then they ask someone who thinks that climate change is not happening. And uh, there was a study recently that uh, tried to quantify that, um, and they made a list of uh, a list of prominent climate scientists and a list of prominent so-called contrarians, so people who deny the science of climate change. Um, I have also not read a lot about <laughs> this in the media because the media was busy calculating Greta Thunberg's carbon emissions. Um, but overall, the so-called contrarians had 49% uh, more media visibility. It was mostly in the US, so not sure how much this can be transmitted to Germany. Um, and even in mainstream sources like the New York Times, uh, it was roughly equal. And there were a few questions about the methodology. There, Some people said, okay, maybe there are just more climate scientists than these contrarians. But even still, like th this looks really disastrous, and this is—I mean, this debate about false balance has been going on for uh, many years. And like in 2011, the BBC had a big discussion about it and said they want to cover this in a more reasonable way, where they don't try to balance scientific facts with some crackpots. But yeah. Um, but also, like, I mean, climate denial in the media is only one problem. You often have this thing that it's simply ignored. Like, I, I see there's an article about airport expansion. Like, I don't know, in Berlin, new airport, okay, a uh, special issue, but like, and then there's not a single word about climate or emissions or anything. Or there was uh, Charles Koch, who was a uh, uh, oil industry uh, guy and uh, who, who funded a lot of climate denial groups and the Washington po he, he died I think yesterday and the Washington Post had a portrait on him and they didn't mention that he was like a big funder of climate denial um, yeah um, there are a few positive um, tendencies where you feel some people in the media get it so The Guardian, they published a new policy where they said they want to avoid terms like climate change and global warming because they feel these are terms that sound too harmless, that tend to play down things, and want instead to use more terms like climate crisis or global heating. Not sure if you have noticed, I also try to do this for my talk. Um, there's an initiative right now which is called Covering Climate Now, where uh, several media publications uh, commit to to make a week where they focus on uh, climate topics uh, before the uh, action day at 20th of September. Um, there are some uh, larger publications in there, The Guardian, CBS, The Nation. Um, there's currently no major publication from Germany in there. They're like Clean Energy Wire and uh, Riff Reporter, and, but nothing, not, n none of the big media uh, publications support this yet in Germany. Um, okay, so what needs to happen? Um, obviously, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, so we need to get rid of things like this. Um, this is uh, Jens Walde. It's not that far from here. It's like the open cast mine uh, where they mine lignite. Like it, which is a very bad form of coal, like even worse than normal coal. And in the back, there's this big uh, Jenschwalde power plant. Um, I don't have a lot of positive messages in this talk, but I have one for you. Um, building renewable energy is probably much easier than people thought. Um, and this is like one of my favorite graphs on renewable energy. So this is from a guy called Auke Hoekstra. 
If you feel like with all this climate doom, you want to have some positive messages in your social media feed, you should follow this guy. Um, so the black line is uh, photovoltaic installations worldwide, like how they happened for real. All the colored lines are what the International Energy Agency predicted for solar installations. So they kind of, every time they make a new report, like they recognize there's more solar than they predicted in their last report, but then they predict, okay, it's going down a bit and then maybe up a bit, like, um, they don't seem to recognize that there's maybe a systemic problem with their prediction here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and like it, it gets worse, like uh, the latest one, they go down even more and yeah. So this looks like an exponential growth, which usually is bad, but for photovoltaics, that's like really good. Yeah. Although, I mean, not to get po too positive, that's all still growing in very low numbers. But I mean, that's, that's really a message that, that also needs to get mo through more that uh, Renewable energy has been growing in a way that nobody predicted. Um, and uh, like, there's, there's a way to fix things here. Um, so yeah, we should change the electricity sector. It's important. It's one of the really huge chunks of carbon emissions. Um, but also, that's kind of the easy part. Even though I know there are problems with storage and solar is only during the day and the wind doesn't always... But I think these are solvable problems. Um, there are some sectors that are much harder. Um, this is a cement plant in Berlin. Um, do you know how cement is made? It's burnt. Huh? It's burnt. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> so... I have a little formula for you with uh, some chemistry. So you take something which is basically limestone and which is uh, chemically uh, mostly calcium carbonate and then you burn it and this turns it into calcium oxide and CO2. So you see there's CO2 here. And the crucial part here is this is CO2 that does not come from energy. Like, there's no coal here, there's no fossil fuels. That comes from the chemistry of turning this limestone into cement. And this is 5% of worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. And the overall emissions are even higher because we need energy to do that and to burn it. And, um, and like, we have no idea how to change that. There are a few experimental technologies to make cement in different ways, but that's kind of basic research. There's nothing that we can roll out now. So that's the hard stuff you talk about when you want to go to carbon neutrality. And there are other hard sectors, for example, airplanes. I mean, okay, they now talk about syn fuels where you kind of turn electricity into oil. You can do that. It's very expensive, not very efficient. Um, there's steel, which uh, is similar to the cement. It's also a chemical process that releases carbon dioxide. You can also do that with electricity, but it's also very expensive and very inefficient. Um, there's fertilizers. If you put out fertilizers, they re release uh, nitrogen dioxide, which is also a greenhouse gas. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then there's... Um, this topic of um, geoengineering. So at some point you come up with the question, can we do something to counteract this warming from the greenhouse effect? Um, one thing there is, which is under the umbrella term solar radiation management, which is doing things that um, we reflect more sunlight. Um, there are ideas that are relatively sound relatively harmless, like painting your roofs in white, but I also the effects are not that big. There are things that are more dangerous, like uh, putting aerosols into the atmosphere, a and some sound a bit more like science fiction, like you have some flying objects that have big mirrors and put them all around the Earth. Uh, th there was also a study about this a few days ago. Um, yeah. 
Uh, this is not very widely discussed yet. And for example, the IPCC very explicitly says they don't consider solar radiation management right now. Um, and under normal circumstances, you would say like uh, pulling chemicals into the atmosphere and we're not really sure what that's going to do. It's probably dangerous. There are probably negative side effects. Sounds really crazy. Um, but you kind of wonder if we end up in a situation where we're, it's either this or the planet is largely uninhabitable. We may need to have that discussion. But there's also this thing like, is the discussion itself already dangerous? Because like there were already politicians who said, yeah, we can put a few aerosols into the atmosphere that solves the problem. And so it's similar to the debate with carbon capture and storage where people may think this is an easy way out, although it's kind of um, not really what we want to do. Like we should really focus on reducing carbon emissions as much as possible. But maybe we should start having a discussion how we can even reasonably discuss about geoengineering and, and what would be the political framework to discuss something like that. And yeah. <coughs> um, then there's a term that comes up uh, often from activists where they say, yeah, what do we want? Climate justice. And, um, and this is often a bit of an abstract term, and um, I want to kind of ground this a bit with a very specific example. So right now, we heard all the news that in Brazil and in also in Bolivia, uh, there's a lot of rainforest burning. And this is, I mean, this is a disaster, and there's also a big risk that this will put the Amazon rainforest over one of these tipping points, which may then introduce further warming. Um, but like, here's a news article that was, it's not a current article, but it was from spring, but uh, where headline says, uh, Brazil puts economy over the rainforest. How dare they? Um, so like, you may wonder, like, if we're from a rich country and doing this, and we complain about uh, poor countries putting the economy over ecology, which we also do all the time. There's a problem here. And how about this? Um, rich countries could pay poor countries to protect the rainforest. Um, who knows who this guy is? Really? No, almost no. OK, <laughs> you're all too young. Um, <laughs> I think this guy is at least partly responsible for what's going on in Brazil right now. Um, his name is Dirk Niebel. He was a Ministry of Development in Germany. Uh, he's from the Free Democratic Party. You can see that with the yellow on the side. Um, in 2007, uh, the uh, Rafael Correa, who was back then the president of Ecuador, they, they had a, an, a nice oil field, which was unfortunately in a national park in the rainforest. And the president said, yeah, we're willing to not get that oil out. We'll protect the rainforest. But only if the world is willing to compensate us for the losses here. And only half of the losses. Like we calculate how much money we would make selling this oil. And if you pay us half of that, we will leave the oil in the ground forever. We will save a lot of carbon emissions. Rainforest will be fine. Um, there were a few countries willing to support it. The biggest contributions were from France and Spain. And for quite a while, it looked like Germany would support it too. Like There were even politicians in the Conservative Party who were very positive about this. Um, but um, Germany pulled out of the project um, and the guy, I showed you the picture, Dirk Niebel, he was uh, responsible for that because he said he doesn't like this approach, he prefers market-based mechanisms. Um, so if you hear that again from members of that party, maybe remember them of this story. Um, so the Yasuni ITT initiative failed in 2013 and now they are drilling oil there. So I think 
the rich countries sent a message there, and that was like, we're not willing to pay for the rainforest. And that's kind of a tragedy. So, how did this all go so wrong? I think a big thing here is we, we really need to recognize the big failure here. Like, nothing that has been done until now had any meaningful impact in slowing this down or stopping this. And there's a failure in climate policy, diplomacy, and also in the environmental movement. And I think, like, a lot of also NGOs need to ask themselves some very tough questions. And I'm quite amazed that many of these more traditional NGOs, how silent they are right now. Like, this is a big topic now, and Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future are getting all the attentions, and you don't hear much from them. And um, I feel they need to have a very tough discussion. And, like, there was a comment in a German newspaper a few days ago where they said, basically, Extinction Rebellion should try to become like the BUND which I, I found completely ridiculous, but yeah. Um, we should recognize that the actions that would be required to do anything meaningful here are not even part of the political discourse. Like, cutting down carbon emissions by half, which would mean cutting them down even more in a rich country till 2030. Like, Try to ask the people from the Green Party if they have a plan for this. Like, I don't think they have one. Um, Extinction Rebellion has this uh, demand to tell the truth. I think that's a good idea. Kind of obvious. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also think that part of the problem here is that in the past, there was also often a tendency to give a hopeful message. We have so many solutions. We're doing so many nice things here. We have all these nice projects, really. Which, but it kind of didn't recognize the overall failure. And this, I think, was particularly true for the uh, climate conferences and the climate treaties, like both the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Protocol. Basically, they didn't do anything meaningful, but the environmental movement was cheering for them. Um, as we're at CCC camp here, I thought I should talk a bit, maybe what can tech people do? Uh, I feel this is coming up quite a bit, like, I mean, I hadn't expected that there are so many climate talks here and we have kind of a, almost a climate village there. Um, but uh, I, if you have good answers to this, I would like to hear them, um, because it often sounds like, okay, yeah, our, our computers need electricity, should be green. It's probably not the things that make a big impact. Um, I have a few proposals what you should not do. Um, building some libertarian utopia technology that's based on wasting a lot of electricity as much as possible all the time is probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you can find a way to kill Bitcoin, like that would have an impact. You're hackers. Think about that, really. Um, yeah, what's the tech industry doing? Um, what do you think this is? Any guess? Yeah, roughly like that. No, no. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I call this the Google Division for Accelerated Climate Chaos. Um, this is Google's Department for Services for the oil industry. I mean, don't you see it? Like, he here's an oil rig I in gray. Um, yeah, okay, there's also solar cells, but um, if you scroll down, it says, yeah, as their computing demands grow, oil and gas companies like Schlumberger, Total, Anadarko, and others rely on Google Cloud to scale workloads, such as seismic interpretation, regression analysis, and classification, and so on and so on. 
I, I mean, that's... <laughs> If you want to have, it's kind of like a made-up example for greenwashing, right? Um, yeah, don't be evil. Um, um, and I just picked Google because this web page was so ridiculous. But um, there was a, a very well-researched article on Gizmodo um, recently, where uh, like all the big cloud companies have departments that offer specific services to the oil industry. And they make a lot of uh, of deals with with uh, yeah uh, lots of money involved. They're also like yeah you can use machine learning to find more oil and drill more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was mostly it. I wanted to ask you if you want to join some protests, and because I have some suggestions for you, there's a. There's a protest against the International Car Fair in Frankfurt at the 14th of September. Then, of course, there's the global climate strike with Fridays for Future and many others supporting them. 20th of September, and there will be more actions in the week following it. And um, Extinction Rebellion will have worldwide actions on 7th of October. So, yeah, support these organizations, and um, thank you. Thank you, Hanno. So, we have some time for questions, and I already see someone lined up at the microphone. I, can I ask you to please uh, speak loud and clear? And, yeah, so, please. Check, check, check. Okay. This message is very bleak, and I am, you know, devastated, very emotional. So this is like a general message. It is okay to feel these emotions. It is okay if I, we connect our brains with our hearts, because when I first learned about this, I wanted to cry. And to cry, it is okay, but it also can give us energy to do meaningful projects, the large-scale engineering projects. 50 years ago, we went to the moon. So now, if we apply our engineering resources, I believe we can uh, reverse climate change. This will require a lot of changes on the United Nations, on the government levels, and uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I guess that was not a question. No, so this is, this, I think that was pretty much a <laughs> yeah, statement, thank but you. Um, thank yeah. you for that. All right, next question, please. This is this is actually a question. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. Really, really good. Really nice to have these resources. Um, without trying to be too vague or too airy-fairy, if you could click your fingers and change one thing or a few, what would that be? Or in more political terms, if there were theoretical extreme actions that could be taken, what should they be? Mm, I, I guess the, I mean, the thing that has the biggest impact is stopping coal. Uh, that would be the first step, right? Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I really, really liked your talk. Yeah. And um, I had an idea um, what maybe hackers also could do, um, because uh, I was really happy to come here and um, meet all these hackers, because I'm a completely dummy. I even cannot do calculations in MATLAB or something. Um, um, three weeks ago, we were sitting together with Scientists for Future in Bremen, and we were talking about that only 10 to 15 percent of the Germans know what Fridays for Future is and what they demand. So uh, this is unbelievable because everyone from our, of us knows us, knows it. And um, so we have to somehow break out of these social media bubbles. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how it works exactly, but I had the idea that maybe hackers <laughs> could help us to place climate content in other bubbles mm. to m raise awareness, which yeah. doesn't change the world, but it would support us, the scientists, because the scientists are cl complete dummies with, about communication and internet and stuff. Mm. I don't know if it helps, but th uh, this yeah. was my idea. Uh, yeah, I I'm not entirely sure if the hackers are the best group to do public relations also. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but maybe, maybe but you we can have, have a Tagesschau now. and then. No. I oh, don't okay. Know. Like, uh, I, I mean, we had this. Uh, we had a discussion about defacements and denial of service yesterday. But I, I I'm very skeptical that this is uh, something that will have a big impact. But w I'm happy to have a discussion about this afterwards. Um. Uh. Thanks. Uh, thanks for mentioning false balance and the media in, in, in their role. Do you see any way to interfere at that point, that false balance? <laughs> I, I mean, one of the things is that I, I was working as a journalist in this area, and right now I'm mostly not. I'm mostly doing IT stuff. So, I mean, yeah, you can try to be a, become a journalist or try to influence the media like that and no, I mean what is the what is the mechanism that drives this false balance why do they still do that I, I mean I uh, okay so I mean there's this, this general tendency that journalists want to be balanced which sounds kind of reasonable um, unless you you go to things where we talk about facts right we also don't balance that like did the moon landing happen um, but so I think there's there's not this recognition that this is not a matter of opinion that we're talking about facts here. Um, but there's also like I mean this is kind of a politicized issue, and you feel like okay now we did the Green Party friendly article, now we need the other party friendly article, which is pro things like that. It, is it, I have the suspicion that it's because they want to create a debate that is emotionally enraging. Yeah, I mean that's also. I mean that's also what we see with the uh, uh, with that the right wing movement has much but more representation. Than hacking them. the media. I mean, isn't that a way that is worth I, 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 I mean, I, I'm not a psychologist, but I mean, it, it's uh, facts are difficult. Like uh, they are boring. They're not nice stories. They're. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Um, on the on the back of the comment about that we went to the moon, uh, pretty much in the past, I don't know, 400 years, all major advances, major projects, happened because of competitions between countries, more or less, all the way from colonization mm. to going to the moon to even building the internet. Um, do you feel that we could ever get to a place like this again, where actually we can? start competing with something mm. to go somewhere or actually our mm. connectedness today which also makes wars impossible makes it impossible for us to actually yeah. put down our iPhones and yeah. build something okay so with the competition between countries you have this kind of this problem that if you do something to reduce emissions it's uh, it's an advantage for the whole world so there's not a big incentive for a single country to do more than the others, which is kind of this tragedy of the commons. Like, I'm not an economist, but so I feel it, it's... I mean, of course, there is competition about solar energy. There is competition about electric cars, although I would prefer less cars. But um, so I think this competition can help in some areas, but for the overall issue, it feels the incentives are not aligned with that. Because there's no incentive for one country to be the climate leader. All right, next question, please. Uh, you don't have to answer, but uh, what do you think will happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, okay, I, but like, I feel there will be a point where it's so obvious that we have a problem that we will discuss this in a different way. The problem is just, it will probably at a point where our options are limited. Uh, and we may have a debate about geoengineering or whatever. But Thanks. Please. For instance, one example, if so, uh, sea level would rise by three meters just tomorrow, everybody would know that we have a problem. So, in my opinion, when do we know 
that we really have a problem and this comes to the masses and everybody mm. sees, oh, something is really going wrong, so we need to do something. I think this is the first okay. uh, thing when we will start acting. I mean, I don't think this is a one point in time issue and I think we are already seeing that. I mean, there's definitely a connection between we had this crazy summer last year and then the topic came and then the Humber Forest was in the news and then the Green Party grew and so there is already something happening where you clearly see a connection between events unfolding and more people caring about the topic. It's not enough yet, we know that, but, and, but I don't know where the critical point will be where we can have really a discussion about doing something seriously. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, we have one more question from one more question from the audience, Hello, please. Thank you for your talk and also the other one. Thanks. Um, I was wondering. I'm thinking a lot right now about the, also the media coverage that you mentioned, and I'm from Austria. And in the last months, I had this feeling that it was not and not a downplaying of the effects, but like more a hysteria. So um, there is like climate crisis everywhere and it's like catastrophic scenarios everywhere, but it's in a kind of science fiction way sometimes. So it's, it's maybe even overdone. And also I cannot recall anymore where, but I read that also the, um, also the, 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 the crisis version of what is happening, like in the story, to yeah. tell that it's all going to shit, um, is not having an effect because it makes the masses too helpless, because mm. it's too big. And um, so this is what I'm thinking right now about also um, yeah. in, in what I do, um, how, um, how there would be a way to communicate um, not with downplaying, but also not with this extreme hysteria, but telling how bad it is, um, yeah, without shocking people so much that they just keep doing what they're doing because there is no point in it, something like that. And I was wondering if you have hmm. um, a comment on that or maybe like a third way between okay. us. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, one problem is that the hysteria and the what sounds like science fiction is often what we can read out of the science. So I, I don't think it's legit to say this is hysteria when this is the prediction from the science we have. Um, also, I feel like, I mean, Extinction Rebellion does this very extreme with these shocking messages. And like they are growing like crazy. Like I, in Berlin, I, I, I get kind of a newsletter from them there where they, they do something every day. And so, I, I mean, we, we kind of enter in an area which is psychology and there are also some debates whether which kind of messaging works, although I have a lot of doubts about psychology as a science. That's a different topic. Um, but my feeling is that these shocking messages and this really like staying within the science but telling the science how bad it is, is looks to me like it's working. L at least it's working better than what we did before. So, so you would say that like everything that is going out, as long as it stays as much as the current facts as possible, um, is um, should should be a good thing, right? Yeah, I think I'd say so. I mean, there are occasionally situations where. There was, for example, an article by a journalist called David Wallace-Wells, which was uh, in the New Yorker, and it was criticized a lot because it was based on a scenario that is, has some assumptions that are not very realistic. So there are occasionally situations where people overdo things and people are going, like, it's maybe still within the science, but it's not very realistic. A and I think it's reasonable to, to have that discussion. But also, uh, this is not very often, and what we see much more often is the downplaying. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay, 
So, thank you for your questions. I want you to give Hanno a big round of applause again, please. Thank you. Thank you.